Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us once again, listeners. I appreciate you giving us a little bit of time today. With me is Travis and Mark Macy. Mark's also known by Mace. And we are going to be discussing predominantly um, their adventures with the Eco Challenge Fiji in 2019, which is hard enough. But Mace has early onset Alzheimer's. And so that just added maybe a couple of little extra challenges. <laughs> so thanks for joining me today, guys. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. It's uh, great to be here with you and with your listeners. Uh, we really appreciate you having this podcast on such an important topic. And, uh, you know, in our in our last, uh, I don't think anyone wants to uh, enter the Alzheimer's community, but, uh, you know, once, once that diagnosis <laughs> To yourself or someone in your family or a friend, um, the community really has has a value. And that's it, it, it true. Like it's it's an honor to be with you. And it, it's really been important to us to just be be part of this community, you know, be be part of the, the greater team, as it were. Well, Travis also has his own podcast, the Travis Macy Show, and that is on basically on endurance athletics, athletics, <laughs> correct? Yeah, kind of, you know, dad uh, hosts most of those episodes with me and, and we do a lot of endurance athlete guests on there because that's kind of what we're into. But we also <laughs> talk about Alzheimer's and we talk about uh, books and parenting and, uh, you know, kind of I'm very thankful I get to spend an hour a week talking to someone that about something I'm interested in. <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> I always tell people you can tell what's been going on or what's piqued my interest by what I recorded when. So yep. that's cool. So you and with a little help from your dad, Mace, wrote a book called One Mile at a Time. It's predominantly, I don't know, well, it's half the beginning of your Alzheimer's journey, but it's also about the eco challenge Fiji that you guys participated in in 2019. So before we get into the challenge, let I wanted to throw this one to Mace and ask him what the early stages before diagnosis was like when you kind of suspected something was going on, but you didn't know what was going on. And then we can talk about maybe what what getting the diagnosis was like. Cause I don't, I don't know what that was like for my mom. Cause I don't know when it, I know when it happened, but it was after the fact. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> do you want to ask me the question? Again, Certainly. I know I okay. said that a little quickly. So you were diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at 64, but you <laughs> started having trouble at 60. Is that correct? I don't know exactly when I started having trouble, you know, I'm, and I, I don't know if anybody can tell for sure when their onset starts, you know, for me, you know, I, I could tell things were kind of out of, out of shape and not particularly the way I would like them to be. And, and you know, and it, I just thought at some point, and I'm, you know, I can't believe I got this coming on, you know, but I think it is. And, and I just got to go with the flow and do the best I can and, and just stay with it. And that's what I've been doing. Now, you're you basically a retired attorney. Yes. Did it, in our, my family, by, my mom tried to hide it. And I, my dad, I think, tried to deny that anything was going on, which we all know is not helpful. Was that ever something you considered just not telling people what was happening or keeping it just in the family? No, you know, I never, you know, I was a lawyer and a lawyer for a long time, and that never entered into, you know, Alzheimer's never entered into my thoughts when I was a lawyer, you know, it's nothing, nothing, 
interrupted it, I guess. And and as far as did I try to keep my Alzheimer's a secret, I'm just the opposite. I'll tell anybody who wants to know about Alzheimer's. I'll tell them anything I I can tell them. And I and I and I actually I try to do it all the time. I talk to people, anybody who wants to know about Alzheimer's. I'm not an expert, and I'll talk to you for till the cows come home if you want to. Well, I think that's important, and I think Travis probably agrees. What was the the initial beginning of the well the diagnosis and the beginning of this journey like for you? Because that must be, I know how much harder it was. Well, my mom also had early onset Alzheimer's. I forget that because she had it for so long. Um, What was that like for you, Travis? Yeah, yeah, very hard. You know, like I said, that's, you know, this is, uh, no no one wants to to hear that news. Uh, You know, you have Alzheimer's, your your parent has Alzheimer's, your sibling has Alzheimer's. That's, you know, it's it's, it's bad news. And, And I think, you know, for a lot of people, it probably doesn't come as a surprise necessarily because, you know, there have been some signs over time. And and for dad, one of the first challenges was, was some challenges with navigation and map reading. You know, he had always been very good with uh, navigating with, with the map and compass out in the woods or navigating the streets around Denver, you know, his, his work commute and getting around the traffic and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, at some point, um, that got a bit harder. Uh, and, and my advice, again, I'm, I'm not a doctor or anything either, but I do feel like one thing I've learned over the last few years is, whereas in the past, you know, the story about Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment or other types of dementia was, you know, there's no treatment and no cure. And if there's not a treatment or a cure, like, why would you even want to know, right? And I think that maybe a lot of people from addressing it, you know, actually going in and confronting this and finding out what's going on. And, you know, my understanding, my opinion now is, is, you know, there still is no defined cure. There's no pill you can take ahead of time or, or afterwards where this is fixed, but there are a lot of things that can be done potentially that might add up to slow the progress. And that could be diet. It could be medications. It could be lifestyle. It could be exercise. It could be, you know, the family working really hard to be a team and help the person stay engaged with what they love to do. Um, Those things really make a difference. And and so my advice, you know, if, if you yourself, or again, maybe someone in your family, if, if you think this might be a possibility, you know, check it out. And I know that's really hard. I know it's so hard to initiate that conversation with, uh, you know, excuse me, with your, with your parent or, you know, your sibling, your friend, but, but you got to do it. It's, um, it's really important. Uh, and, and then I will say, you know, just building off of dad's answer, you know, he decided right from the start, like, um, you know, he's not going to hide from this. He's going to try to, I think sometimes when, when we have a really hard thing going on, um, you know, we can make a bit of a choice, like, are we going to spend most of the time kind of in the, I'm feeling sorry for myself mode, or are we going to try to spend most of the time and let's, somehow use this to, to empower ourselves or help, help other people. And that's, um, dad started to do that from the start. He started journaling, like, uh, no joke. The, um, <laughs> the day he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, he, he, and, and with, of course, the help of my mom, you know, dad was mostly dictating to mom, um, you know, started keeping this journal kind of about his thoughts and, you know, how he might want to make a difference of it. And, and that's something we really tried to, um, to highlight in, in our book, a mile at a time. Um, and I can't, I have some of those journals. If, if you think it'd be relevant, we can read a little or, or not. Um, but it's anyway, there's some of that stuff in the book and I'm really proud of dad for putting that out there. I appreciated the advice at the end that came from mm-hmm. Mace. That was, there was some good stuff in there that I'm going to yep. want to come back to, but early on, and there's a reason I'm asking this question you guys decided to try the Dr. Bredesen protocol. I've met him. I have his book. I had planned on essentially thumping that book over my doctor's head and saying, we need to deal with some of this stuff. Cause my mom was the third generation with cognitive impairment. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother had vascular dementia from a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months. That was fun. 
But I also think she may have had mixed dementias just based on what I know, which is not as much as I'd like. And my maternal great grandmother had dementia and she died before I was born. So I don't have any details on that. So I was really, I thought this is the kind of thing you need to start early and being self-employed and not having an actual doctor that was, I was assigned to, I mean, I quasi had a doctor, but I didn't. And then being self-employed, it got to the point in 2018 where, or 2019 where it was like, well, do we pay the mortgage or do we pay the health insurance bill and the mortgage one? So I never went through that protocol, but I know you guys did and your findings weren't positive. Do you feel like that is something that might be beneficial if it was started earlier or is it just wishful thinking science? Yeah, I mean, I would say maybe, uh, you know, and, and a lot of a challenge in, you know, I would say one, one of my takeaways, again, back to, you know, some sort of advice, if you will, at the end of the book is like, you got to, you got to embrace this uncertainty. And that's, and that's really hard. And and again, you can do all these things, whether again, it's traditional medicine, non traditional medicine, uh, you know, the Bredesen protocol diet, etc. Um you never actually know is, is it helping or not? Because, you know, if you're slowing the disease process, um, in many ways, that's a, that's a win. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I'd say that the jury's still out. We're still learning, you know, there's good, like the last fall, a, a new medication was finally approved by the FDA, the Biogen aducanumab and, and dad doesn't currently qualify for that, but, you know, within the Alzheimer's community, to me, that seems like a plus, you know, even if the data is maybe isn't quite there or, or is less certain, you know, I mean, I think for most people who have Alzheimer's, it's, hey, if something might help, well, you might as well uh, try it. And and I will also say, back to your previous question, Jennifer, you know, you mentioned that that initial diagnosis phase, that for me was really, really hard. And it really did, um, you know, impact my mental health uh, for some time. And, you know, created this this uh, crazy desire to uh, try to control things. Again, it feels out of control. What can you control? The finances, the planning, the you know, the the wills, the this that, like all these things. Um, and in hindsight, I can realize like, yes, that's it's good. You want to you know have some view on future planning, but my takeaway overall is be present. You know, like what a what a gift of of something like Alzheimer's is, you know, for many people, it, it, it makes things harder imagining the future and also remembering the past, but you got the present. So be present, you know, and that's, that's what I've tried to do with, with my dad is be present, enjoy time, have fun, you know, go, go do stuff. And it may look different than it did before, but we can still spend time together and spend time with the grandkids and, uh, that be, being present in that way is, is crucial. Um, and it's also, I mean, I heard you talking, like if anyone's listening to this and you're the child of someone who, who has Alzheimer's, that's a man, that's, it can be an anxious place to be, right? You see these things happening. You, you, you don't know what's going to happen over time. And it, in an obvious question is, you know, is this coming uh, for me? Um, and, you know, and in some ways we don't know, but we're also learning more and more those same things, sleep really well, eat really well, you know, exercise, like uh, those you know, I think those things make a difference. My, I've definitely changed, especially my my sleep habits, to really focus on more sleep and better sleep and good sleep hygiene. And I think that can make a difference. I agree. If I get a really terrible night's sleep, my brain is screaming at me the next morning to have a donut or pastry or like garbage I don't generally eat to begin with. Uh, and it's amazing that your brain, you know, like you wake up and it's going, let's have a donut. It's like, no, we're not going to have a donut. It's, I find that absolutely fascinating. So Mace is Travis doing a good job doing fun things and staying present with you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We spend a lot of time together and, you know, we're both athletes and we both spend a lot of time, uh, you know, you know, I, I I spend almost all of my time running and, and stuff like that. And I, and, you know, I just want everybody to know that I, I don't believe that Alzheimer's is going to get me. I'm, you know, it's going to have to kick my ass before I go. That's for sure. And I, you know, and I, 
I think that, you know, someday, someday is going to come when that person, you know, says, hey, uh, you know, I'm Bill Johnson and I just cured Alzheimer's disease and it's going to happen one of these days and I, I'm going to be there when that happens. And, and I, I tell anybody I can, please just, just be as optimistic as you can be and, and, and be fit and, and, and just keep at it and don't quit. Just keep going all day, every day. I think of it all the time. And it's for Bredesen. I thought that guy was a quack, man. I took that, you know, I took that medication and it was nothing. Maybe it was just, you know, maybe it was just me, but I thought it was just quackery. So, I don't know, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimistic guy and I'm going to stay an optimis, optimistic guy and, and I'm not going to quit. I tell, tell that to everybody and I hope everybody, you know, I don't know anything. I'm just some goof, you know, who, you know, just doing the best I can. And I, I just hope everybody at least thinks about keeping at it and don't quit and you can make it. Something's going to get all of us. So we might as well just enjoy what we've got. I tended used to be, I've worked on it very hard. I tended to be, I was like, you know, people always accuse me of, well, you always see the glasses half full. And I'm like, no, that's baloney. It depends on how thirsty you are. That was my <laughs> realism. And, but I, I can go to the negative place pretty easily. And I've worked really hard not to, especially after the last, you know, couple, two and a half, three years with COVID and everything else. It's like, you know, we had, we had some rough few years between 2016 and 2022. So yeah, it's, you know, eventually you just have to like decide that, you know, this sucks right now, but it'll be over at some point and then we'll move on to something else. And that isn't always easy, but sometimes when you just release the, I hate this, this is hard. You know, like I had my website blow up and as soon as I got that fixed, my editing team floundered and failed on me. And it was just like, what the heck, you know, do I have to do everything myself to get it done? And in the long run, I have a better website and I have the same editing team and I'm spending less money. So like, okay, well, hard to complain about that. So it was, okay. it was easier. Thank you. It was easier to just basically say, this is super frustrating and I'm just going to do what I can to mitigate the stress and the frustration and the anger, because I can see, I can actually see the light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train, which was, which is not the way I used to be when I was younger. So. Yeah. Well, good, good for you. Yeah. Way to, way to persevere, way to hang tough. And, and yeah, I mean, that is, that's something we tried to show in, in the book is, is that, uh, you know, yes, we are really trying to take a strength based approach and we have a great team. And, you know, that, that starts with dad and, and with my mom, who is incredible and, and an energetic person who's, you know, right there with him. She's the, you know, she's really the captain of the team. Um, and, and it's still really hard. Um, and, and sometimes we, you know, we see people who maybe have, who have achieved some sort of success, uh, you know, whether it's sports or business or whatever, you know, or like we, we wrote this book and that's great, but it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's been really hard and it, it continues to be hard. We're still, you know, just, just like other people in the, in the Alzheimer's community, you know, we're, we're finding our way through and we don't know the answers and we're, you know, taking it, um, you know, one mile at a time. Well, let's talk about that. So you guys have been endurance athletes. Well, like, I guess you've been that way your entire life. I don't remember, sorry, when Mace <clears throat> excuse me, started his endurance athleticism. That's the proper but, term. He doesn't either, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, we just ended up almost ended up with a microphone full of water. <laughs> Humor is important too. That's another, that's another, we talk about that in the book. Got up, man. Dad jokes so much about Alzheimer's and it's, it's great. Dad and I were going out for a run. I'm like, hey, dad, you know, you're like, it's hot out. And I'm like, you want some sunscreen, dad? He's like, 
Trav, I have Alzheimer's. You think I give a shit about sunscreen? <laughs> <laughs> I remember that because being a pale blonde, um, I don't really worry about skin cancer because the immediate pain from a burn is worse than what might happen in the future. But yeah, I actually did laugh out loud about that one. My husband laughed because I had to read that line to him to explain why I was laughing. So yeah, that is that is actually pretty funny. And I mean, it's it's kind of the dark humor that my family, you know, um, that's the way we lean. But you guys participated in all kinds of endurance athletic events, running 100 miles. I don't understand this. I have the, the most I've ever done is a 65 mile bike ride. You don't understand I, it? That makes I know. all the sense in the world. <laughs> I like, I like, like my old Everybody cycling. Runs 100 mile. Uh, no, I don't. I don't run at all, man. I always tell people if the bear is chasing me, I am lunch. That is just the way it is, you know. I, I don't. I might be able to outrun or outride him on my bike, but mm, it'd be a challenge. You know, you know, I live in Evergreen, Colorado, and uh, we had a bear in our house. Oh, in the, <laughs> the house! Oh my! <laughs> yeah, my wife ran into the bear in the. In the garage, I think <laughs> it scared scared her a little bit, but and she wasn't too worried. <laughs> well, I speaking, live in... of, speaking of my wife, I got mm -hmm. I got to tell you, you know, without without my wife Pam, I'd be in a I'd be in real trouble. You know, she's she's a perfect wife and and does everything she can to keep me going and. And, uh, and I couldn't go without her. There's some good stories about Pammy in the book, but I'm not going to yeah. spill them all. Cause I want people to read this book. Cause this one's really good. And I, I get a lot of books. <laughs> I have another one. I have to read this week for a recording next week. And it's like, Oh boy, I hope it's as good as this one, but I, I have a feeling it's not. So you guys did these hundred mile races, these multiple day races which that doesn't sound fun either but you enjoyed it sure. so when Still do. i think travis froze on us so we're just gonna have to be you and i mace <laughs> until travis <laughs> comes back <laughs> so what got you started on endurance racing uh i don't know i just started doing stuff when i was a kid i was you know i was all my whole life i played sports you know Stating from starting from high school and and continued on and on and on, you know, and never quit. <laughs> Up to this day. Yeah, so. to this day. Yeah. I still do hundred mile races. Yeah. You pay, you pace people for those now, right? I <laughs> what? You pace people for the hundred mile races? Uh well, I got to tell you, it's been a couple of years since I've done a hundred mile race, but no, nah, I just, you just go do it. <laughs> now there was one, oh, was it the I did a shoe, snowshoe that I you won? Sport. I did a sport. I did a sport. Okay. That you basically won because you were one of the only people your age that showed up. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, that's so that that happens quite frequently. <laughs> you know, if nobody in your age group shows up, you win. But you have but to I still used... participate. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it does make it easier if you're only racing against yourself, though. So when <laughs> did you? <laughs> what that, that one? The idea is the idea is your dad won won that outright. Other people, lots of other people did show up, and that was one he was doing in the early '90s, hundred mile snowshoe race in Alaska, and he he won that a few times. Um, but yeah, later on, as we've talked about on our own podcast, you know, so at, at some point you got to start winning your age group, you know, just because you're kind of the only one left, and that's kind of <laughs> that's how dad's gone in some of these ones. <laughs> But you still have to race. So, you know, it's yeah. not like oh, yeah. just you're not just getting a participation trophy, <laughs> <laughs> which just the thought of 100 miles on snowshoes, that that's a huge calorie burn. You're making me hungry right here before lunch. You know how cool of, it, do you know how cool it is to 
put on snowshoes in the middle of wintertime in Alaska and and just start going. And it is so cool, you can't even imagine. Every now and then you run into a moose or something like that. And, and, a, mu- and a moose is very scary when you see him face to face. Yeah, they're kind of big. I'll yeah, have to add that big. to, I'll have to add the, well, snowshoeing is definitely something I'm interested in doing. I don't know about Alaska. I don't like it cold. So that's one small, <laughs> one small barrier. I am definitely a solar charged, sun worshiping from the shady spots, though, <laughs> kind of gal. So, when did you guys first do? I know you've done more than one eco challenge. So, Travis was doing his own eco challenges. Mace was doing his and with his team. So, Travis, why don't you tell us kind of how that came about? Because the fact that you guys have done them separate but together which makes no sense pretty much but yeah yeah he hasn't participated with your own teams that's a better way of putting it that is how you ended up doing it in 2019 with your dad now we're going to take a quick break for an ad these ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free when i learned that despite eating as healthy as possible we can still have undernourished brains i was frustrated I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the cliff notes are that uh, in in the 80s and early 90s, this sport of adventure racing uh, developed in various places in in Europe and in Asia uh, also in Australia and New Zealand. And the, the basic deal for an adventure race is you got a co-ed four person team. You're traveling together for, you know, often a week at a time or more, you're doing a wide range of sports. So, uh, you know, running, hiking, mountain biking, fixed ropes, paddling of some sort that could be rafts, canoes, kayaks, what have you. Uh, the whole time you're uh, navigating with map and compass, which, which is a huge part of it. You know, you got to not getting lost or getting lost less uh, is is essential. And, and then they also throw at, at you unique disciplines depending on where the race is. So like when dad did the eco challenge in Morocco, uh, they were riding camels, um, you know, and when we in that race in Fiji in 2019, uh, we were using these uh, native Fijian um, outrigger canoes with sails on them, uh, you know, something you would obviously never do here in, in Colorado. So um, that's kind of what the sport is. Uh, in 1995, Mark Burnett uh, wanted to bring this sport to the basically to the big screen and to the public in the U.S. So he's a British guy, he comes to the U.S., tries to put on uh, this first eco challenge in 95 in Utah. And he basically went for broke and maxed out a bunch of credit cards and, you know, so on and so forth uh, and got the race to happen. And and it aired that year on MTV. Uh, And then he subsequently picked up steam and and kept it rolling from 95 to 2002. And uh, he he was very successful with it. Uh, Listeners may remember it was on Discovery Channel and USA Network and, you know, became a a pretty big um, TV thing uh, during that time. And dad and his teammates on Team Stray Dogs uh, were able to do, I think it was like eight of those initial eco challenges between 95 and 
in 02. So they went all over the world, you know, again, Utah, Morocco, Argentina, Borneo, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Patagonia, um, you know, really seeing the world in these awesome places and building friendships and, uh, you know, highs, high highs, low, low lows, uh, all that kind of stuff. And during that time, I was, I was watching that. So I was a, I was a teenager and then I was a college student and I was kind of focused on, you know, team sports and then running in college. Uh, but I was always thinking like, man, this adventure racing is awesome. And, and sometime I'm going to do it. So lo and behold, I finished college, uh, and, and really went for it in adventure racing at that time, the eco challenge race itself wasn't going because Burnett had gone first to survivor as people may know, and, and then to all these other reality shows. I mean, he's kind of, you know, one of the original reality TV producers. So he went on to all these other projects. The Eco Challenge itself wasn't happening, but there were similar races in the United States and around the world. So my teammates and I were able to get some sponsors and travel around and race in New Zealand and Australia and China and various places in South America, Canada, um, you know, for, for a number of years, racing at a high level. Again, having a lot of fun, a lot of challenge, uh, you know, ups, downs, um, but some some kind of cool stuff. And, uh, and then, um, you know, life, life kind of went on over the lat over the kind of a few years before that, that race in 2019, I, I had not been adventure racing as much, you know, more focus on, on my own kids and, and other types of races closer to home, whether that's ultra runs or ski mountaineering and, uh, you know, other things kind of mostly here in Colorado. Uh, but, but then about 2018, you know, we're hearing rumors, eco challenge is coming back, you know, Burnett's going to do it again, Bear Grylls is involved. Uh, and, and at first we thought it was just, you know, internet rumors, but then it turns out it's, it's a real thing. So, you know, dad got excited. I got excited. Our old adventure racing friends, you know, Marshall or who we talk about in the book, uh, everyone's getting pumped for it. And, and we decided we want to go and kind of write about in, in that time that we were you know get applying and getting ready to to do an adventure race in fiji is when when the uh you know the diagnosis came about so um anyway I, I'll, I'll stop there but that's kind of you know some background to the to the story so um yeah you know i kind of went again most most of our racing we were on different teams you know dad was on a team with folks his age i was on a team you know with folks about my age and you know we were kind of going for the podium and they were um, you know, usually weren't, but, but we're still participating very much. And finally we got to do one together and, um, it was awesome. We had, we had a blast out there. Well, you just, you both teams qualified for eco challenge Fiji, and then you got the diagnosis and that kind of changed the thought pattern about participating. What walk us through that that time in your life, Travis, what, cause that's, I mean, there are a lot of caregivers that become helicopter caregivers. They do too much. They, they care too much. They do too much. It's just, they fuss. And I, you know, I, I wasn't quite like that, but I do not think I could have taken my mother on one of these kind of races, <laughs> not to mention neither one of us would have survived. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, what, what yeah, kind of well, insanity do you just that makes you decide to do this kind of endurance challenge that's all physical and mental with somebody in their 60s and with a cognitive disease? I mean, yeah. well, seriously, are you crazy? No, that's a that's a <laughs> it's a great question. It's a reasonable question. And 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 what it came down to is that, you know, for basically I decided that the what's really important to me about this race is doing it with my dad. And that's more important than, than being out there again, going for the podium or whatever. And furthermore, it's going to be a better fit for my dad and for, you know, his other buddies who are all approaching 70 as well, you know, it's going to be hard enough for them to, you know, be out there without this unknown fifth teammate that we call Alzheimer's. Um, so, so we could, that's, that's how the teams, you know, kind of mixed up and, and it ended up, I think being the best choice, all around. And, and then as far as why do you do it, you know, it was important to dad and it was important to me. And, and on the one hand, is there risk and uncertainty to going out in the jungle in Fiji for a week with Alzheimer's? Like, hell yeah. I mean, 
Well, the, we, before, we, but before we, we go any further, I got to tell you before, because I might not remember this. <laughs> all of this stuff that we've talked about so far is perfectly normal for Travis and to me. But I want to tell your listeners, uh, avoid the uh, racing with camels. They're they're <laughs> yeah. they're they're bad. You know they're bad animals, and and all they do is trying to kick your ass. You know I spent probably twenty hours on one of those things, and. and and about 80 of them, I was laying on the ground, and, <laughs> and it kept stomping me. So <laughs> stay away from them. Well, yeah, so the, the camels, camels were 1999 in Morocco. So for 2019 in Fiji, we knew there, there's not a single camel in Fiji. So we knew that various challenges, but not a camel. So anyway, I was saying, like, on the one hand, yes, there's a lot of risk and uncertainty to this. But but on the other hand, this is important, and and we gotta stay engaged. And and that's I had a great conversation with a, a kind of one of my friends and mentors who's who's a doctor. Um, you know, he's twenty years older than me, so more wisdom over time. But but you know, one of the things he said, he, he said, "Hey, Travis, um, you know, when when especially older people when they have an illness, an injury, a diagnosis." Those who stay engaged and continue to pursue whatever gives them life, they're, they're health-wise, even if that's, you know, recovery from a broken leg or something, that, that engagement is crucial. And, and that's, you know, at that time, that's, that's what kept dad engaged. And we also, like, it may look different. So this isn't our first adventure race. Like we wouldn't have said, oh, like, oh, let's try our first adventure race. Like we got four people out here. We all know what we're doing. We're, you know, we're, we're very confident in our abilities. So it, you know, that makes it less of a stretch. Um, but, but we also said, this is a way to, again, to stay engaged and, and it's going to look different than in the past. We're going to go slower. We're going to have to change our strategies, et cetera, et cetera. We know that there's some risk that, that, for example, if dad got a really bad infection in Fiji, you know, could, and those things exist. There's all kinds of junk out there in that water in Fiji, you know, leptospirosis and all this like nasty stuff. If dad gets something like that, could could that impact his his cognition, you know, in the short and long term? Maybe so. You know, we don't know, but we knew that was a risk. But we also knew we want to stay engaged going as fast as we can and also as as slow as we must. And going into it with with an open mind. Um, so anyway, since then, like as dad said, he's still an athlete, he's still active. You know, have we been doing multi-day adventure races? No. But if we've been doing shorter runs in, you know, in Leadville, Colorado, where where dad loves it, yes. So like you you keep doing what you can when you can, and and it's gonna look different, but it but it's also not black and white. It's not like, oh, here's this diagnosis and you just stop doing everything. Like keep doing the things you love and maybe do them in a different way. And hopefully you have a team that helps support you with with that. Well, I'm not gonna give away the results of the race, but I'm gonna circle i'm going to circle back to the race in a second but you said something that was super important for life dealing with alzheimer's dealing with adventure racing <laughs> is you got to have a team and your family's done a really good job coming together and being a team for mace and helping support him and your mom what what advice do you give because so many people they think I, I can, I got this, I can do this. You know, this is my mom or my spouse or whatever, you know, I, I I'll take care of it. I'll deal with it. And how do we make people understand that that is not the path to go down? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I and, and I don't know, cause you know, whether it's general, generationally or regionally or, you know, did different people have different views and, and that that's okay. You got to do what works for you, but yeah, my view is just life is a team sport. And, and we all, one thing I've learned from, from adventure racing, you know, you're going to be out there for a week with four other people. Everyone's going to have moments where they're the strongest person on the team and they can think straight and they can make the choices and they can carry more stuff for, you know, they're better at that, that particular sport. 
but you're also going to have times, and, and we all had this in Fiji, you know, including me and, and the other younger teammates, where you're the weak person and you're struggling, and you you need help, and you need to you need to learn how to ask for help and how to accept help, and and I think those are just great great life lessons. And and I would also say sometimes, um, I think sometimes people don't ask for help or accept help because they think it's a, a burden like on the helper. And, and my experience is in most human interactions, you know, I don't care if this is adventure racing or Alzheimer's or, you know, whatever. Most people like to help other people. Humans are a social species and it feels good to help someone. And, and the person who who can be the helper that's empowering to them. Um, so, so if if you're reluctant to accept that help, whether you're the caregiver or you know a person with a diagnosis or or whatever, remember, like you you know you in many ways you're giving someone an opportunity to make a difference, and and that's that's good for them. So, um, yeah, give that some thought. You know, especially if if you haven't asked for help before. I know, like in, in my own journey with uh, with mental health, like the first time I realized, hey, I need to reach out to a therapist here and get some support. It's it's a hard step, right? But once once you've done it, it, it becomes easier. It's like anything. You do something over and over. And and really for dad and I in that adventure race, it helped us become more comfortable with with you know new roles that may develop over time, right? You know, for for dad and for a man of his generation, that that accepting help, that's not a natural thing to do. And and for me, you know, in my mind, I'm like, okay, you know. At some point, there's going to be this shifting of roles with, within the family. That, that happens to everyone. But all of a sudden, it's like, you know, holy cow, my dad is, you know, 64 years old. This is coming way sooner than I think. And I'm not ready for this. But going through the process of, of putting myself in a situation where I had to be ready, that showed me I was ready. And it also showed dad, hey, I, you know, I can accept some help. And we can, we can hold hands through this and walk together and be a team. And was that, that's, that's adventure racing and Alzheimer's. Cause yeah, I couldn't oh, totally. tell which one, yeah, I, was like, I couldn't <laughs> tell exactly which one you were talking about. So it, I'm talking about both. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, yeah. And even more, you know, mm. after the race and, you know, again, looking forward, like none of us in this, all, we don't know what's coming or when it's coming. And, and you know, if, if we can be sure that, that we're in it together, um, that's that's huge. And I would also say if you're listening to this and you're feeling isolated and you're feeling like I'm alone, how do I, get, you know, again, wh whether you have uh, Alzheimer's or, you know, maybe you're a caretaker and you're, you feel isolated alone, you know, just like remember you you get to pick your team, you know, reach out, reach out to, you know, people like Jennifer, who are leaders in the community or the Alzheimer's Association. I mean, they have resources or, you know, we worked with another great nonprofit called Mind What Matters that, that supports caregivers, you know, make those calls, talk to talk to other caregivers, like find something because because I guarantee you are not alone in whatever your situation. There's other people going through the same stuff. And if you can connect with them, I'm telling you, it'll 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 be better. And, and again, you know, you don't have to like this is this, this is life. You know, if, 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 if you're in the situation like, Oh, we're trying to hide this, you know, from the family or the community or whatever, you know, I'm telling you, if, if sharing what's going on, you're going to help someone else, not only where you help yourself, but you're going to help someone else who's going through something tough too. Or possibly the same thing. Yeah. I actually talked to a person whose family member was prominent in the community, did not want their diagnosis out there shame embarrassment didn't want yep. to be pitied all of those are very normal but people were starting to ask what's going on with your person trying yeah. to be very anonymous with this so that we can't tie it back to the person i talked to yeah and we kind of came to the conclusion that being very prominent in the community and doing things to the community was the way to approach admitting what was going on so you have you know and it could be cancer or parkinson's it doesn't have to be alzheimer's yeah yep it's like can we start a community fundraiser or you know a support group or you know it was like how can admitting you have this issue benefit the community so i do not know what the result was of that i hope i find out at some point but yeah it's sometimes you know you just have to 
you have to reorient how you're thinking about telling people, asking for help. Because a lot of people think, well, you know, a lot, a lot of what I hear is, well, my loved one doesn't want anybody helping them with personal, you know, private, like toileting and showering and that stuff. I'm like, that's fine. Get somebody to clean the house and walk the dog and, you know, get the groceries delivered and, you know, have somebody else set up bill pay on your bank account. If you, you know, or have your grandkids do that or whatever, if that's not something that you're comfortable with doing, have a distant family member call insurance companies and doctor's offices and all that crap that I can't stand doing. And then you have the time and the, 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 you know, the time and the, what is the energy? There we go. Yeah. To, to do the harder personal care items. You don't have to hire somebody to do that. There's a lot of ways of getting help. I, I talk about them on my website. I talk about them a lot in these episodes, you know, got to be creative, which is kind of what you guys have done. Yep. So you decide. Great advice, to- Jennifer. Yeah. And the creativity is <laughs> creativity is huge. And, and then, you know, another story from the, or another saying that dad, dad's a man of, of many sayings and you know used to always say keep the faith and he used to always say uh it's all good training like the idea when you're going through something hard it, it, it's training you know it's all it's tough you don't want to do it but you're, you're training you're building resilience for the future and actually dad dad just got a got a tattoo his first tattoo is on his arm it says it's all good training um but uh the uh what was i saying oh it was going to be another one of dad's sayings and now, now I've lost it. I don't know. Maybe, Uh-oh, maybe that's brain my cell early, died. early Alzheimer's coming. <laughs> but, uh, no, I was just going to say that's, that, that's all, it's all good, good advice um, for sure. And being, yeah, it's, being creative. Especially is really we've important. got, we've got a huge shortage of caregivers that we can hire. So knowing that, and it's, it's a very difficult field. And if you're not a good, you know, if you have not been a manager of people in your adulthood, um, like I, I, I am half entrepreneur and half artist, and I very much prefer doing things my ways. <laughs> I'm not real good at delegating. So it would be easier for me to just hire the housekeeper, the dog walker, the landscaper, have the groceries delivered. I can organize all that. That's easy. And then deal with the personal stuff. But If you can't deal with the personal stuff, if that is not in your wheelhouse, then you might have to think of other ways to get stuff done because there's only so many hours in the day and there are not enough hours in the day to deal with all of your stuff, all of the household stuff and Alzheimer's. That's, I think that's the thing people don't understand is that it's just, you know, certain things take longer because, you know, I'm sure Mace can tell you it takes a little longer because the processing is slower and remembering how to do things is slower. And it's just, you know, you can't rush it just like toddlers. You can't rush them. <laughs> well, I'm sure you know that because you have kids. Uh, mine, mine is mine is not a kid anymore. She's almost 30. Oh, she'll be 31 when this comes out. So, right. you know, yeah, I'm like, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's just you got to be creative, which is kind of what you guys did in Fiji. Um, you know, I love the phrase as fast as we can, as slow as we must, because I really kind of think that's a good metaphor for life or a saying for life or yep. maybe a guiding phrase to to think about as you're running through life, because I can't believe how fast the years go by nowadays. Mm-hmm. It's almost scary. I Part of me still thinks we're in like 2020, maybe beginning of 2021. When this comes out, it'll be, God forbid, January of 23. That just freaks me out. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so that is when the book is going to be published. So we are recording this early so that we get all the good stuff from Mace and we're ready to go as soon as the book is ready. So I yeah. got to, I got to, thanks. I got to read it pre publication. There's no page numbers on those pages. No, no page numbers. <laughs> yeah. And I think the, um, so the book, A Mile at a Time, that'll be available uh, online for pre-order August 15th, um, 2022. And then it'll hit shelves uh, in March, March 14th, 2023. Um, but again, that that online date, that's that's coming real soon. And, and also, if 
if people are interested in um, in exploring that that race more, um, that's on Amazon Prime. If you search "world's toughest race," um, that that'll come up on there. And I think it's a t- ten episode series, and um, you know, I pretty good. They they put big resources into all the filming, helicopters. You know, you got Bear Grylls out there doing the hosting thing. Um, I think it makes for pretty good TV. Well, it's, it's on great, my watch that's list. Great. That's great TV, by the way. You can take me and Travis out of it and, and all of this <laughs> Alzheimer's stuff because it's a great TV show. Man, yep. it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life and really cool. Well, you've been immortalized for sure. So <laughs> I want to get back to Fiji before we probably should let you guys go for the rest of your afternoon. You had to be creative with getting through the race just in general, because it's obviously, you said world's toughest race. So that's, that's a hint right there. But you had the extra teammate of Alzheimer's. So what was some of the decisions that you made specifically knowing that, you know, the evening and dark hours are terrible for people with Alzheimer's? Um, Mace has significant visual processing issues like my mother did. I have really funky vision, so I can understand that problem because I have no depth perception, which is why I don't play sports where you throw a ball at me. And and I don't like to ride my bike as the sun is setting because that that gray pre-sunset time when there's not a lot of contrast in the light is really hard for me to figure out where stuff is. So I can relate. So you had to make choices based on some of that kind of stuff and knowing that sleep deprivation is really terrible for all of us, but especially for Mace. So what, yeah. what were some of your choices that you had to contend with? Yeah. For me? Yeah, man, Jennifer, you really nailed it. I mean, the biggest shift for us was sort of managing the nighttime and, and uh, listeners will see if you watch that on Amazon, you know, a lot of these teams out there aren't sleeping very much. They may be, you know, the first night and they don't sleep at all. The next night, you know, maybe they do half an hour or an hour, or, you know, two hours or something like that. Um, you know, my my advice to someone doing this race, I, I'd say, you know, sleep at least three hours every night because because it does, you know, on the one hand, the, the clock never stops, right? So that's why people don't sleep because they think, oh, we don't want to lose time, but they forget like, you know, the next day and two days later, if if you can't read the map and you can't remember your teammates' names and you're, you know, <laughs> like wandering around in the jungle, you're going to lose two hours pretty quick. So anyway, for our team, we, we very much realized we got to stop and sleep every night as long as we can, you know, six, seven, eight hours, maybe more. And it needs to be good sleep. We can't just curl up, you know, uh, under, under some jungle tree and hopefully fall asleep. We need to, you know, find, find a house, a school, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, an actual place where people sleep and, you know, lay down and, and get dry. And, and that's what we did. So that became a big part of our strategy is, you know, how can we time things so that we're trying to get to a village, you know, sometime in the, in the evening, early evening, the, the Fijian people are just incredible. I mean, just this amazing, the, this Bula spirit, you show up in the village, remember this dad there, Bula, 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 you know, go Mace, go. Like it was, it was incredible. And you show up in these villages and man, people bring you right into your, into their homes and, you know, simple one room concrete structures with the bamboo floor map. But man, we'd lay down and we're just, you know, so sleeping right in there with, with the family and, you know, little kids, you know, crawling over us and stuff. It was, it was incredible. So that, that for us, that was a big piece of it is, you know, every night it gets dark at exactly six and then the sun rises at exactly six. Cause it's, you know, just about right on the equator. So we need to, do, you know, as much as possible be stopped or asleep during that time. But that also meant during the day we had to move efficiently and not get lost and not make mistakes because they, you know, as people see in the coverage, they had these cutoffs every few days you got to make a cutoff and we knew we'd be chasing those. So there was, there was a lot of strategy to it. And then kind of one, uh, you know, you see on the coverage we'd been out there, what, six or seven nights. And, and one of those nights, like the cutoff was looming and we had to push further than further into the night. Cause we were w- way deep in the mountains, nowhere good to sleep. It's raining, it's muddy. You know, we realized we just got to make it to this village. And, 
we had to go well, well into the night. And, um, you know, that, that I won't give away what happened, but it, it made things fairly tough. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, this book is equal parts advice for life and living with Alzheimer's and travel journal. So, <laughs> and I read it while most of, while I finished it while we were camping um, over, you know, in July. So it was kind of fun. <laughs> You know, and it, I have no no desire to do any of these kind of races, but going to Fiji does sound good. So I've added that to the bucket list. And that's why I think people will really enjoy this book because, you know, you it's so many books on caregiving and Alzheimer's and stuff. While they can be humorous and there's uplifting points, you just added this travel part that's really cool. <laughs> And yeah, well, you know, say, I wanted story. to say something about that is you got to go to Fiji and see the people who live there. They're the, they are the nicest people in the world that I've ever seen. Everybody who lives there, there, I think, is happy to do anything for you. As Travis says, you know, we're living in their houses, you know, and they asked us to come, you know, and and it's just unbelievable. Those those people are so cool. I've been there a couple two times now, and that may go back again someday. Yeah. Well, that yeah. segues really well into what I was going to ask Mace: is what have you got planned coming up for, you know, the next year or so? It's hard to plan too far in advance these days. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Whatever, whatever floats your boat, right? Yeah, I may not have Alzheimer's in a year from now. <laughs> that would great, be awesome. We, we, we take that, huh, Dad? Huh? I said, we right. take that, huh? Yeah. Dad, I'll take Dad, it. Dad, you know, I mean, Dad's staying active, training. He, you know, Dad can't drive anymore, but but his, his buddy, Marshall Ulrich, who we talk about in the book, you know, Marshall lives in town and Marsh can drive. So Marsh drives over and picks up Dad. And, they go for a run, you know, and once they're two, two old guys out on the trail, BS and like, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you have Alzheimer's or if you have, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, try again, just we'll keep going as fast as we can, as slow as we must, uh, you know, this putting a book out, that's a, that's a big effort, but it's also like, it's fun to have a team project, um, that, that dad and I can do together. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll keep podcasting too. That's, that's been fun as well. Dad and I get to have these video calls with, with interesting people. So, you know, we'll, we'll keep doing all that stuff. And, and again, we, we have to keep our minds open to just take things uh, as they come. Um, and I, I've got a rule here. I gotta, I gotta call a client, but you, dad, if you and Jennifer want to wrap up for a few more minutes, you're, you're welcome to, you know, if, if anyone's interested in, in the book, they can, you know, after August 15th, 2022, search it on Amazon or whatever bookstore, or you can go to um, travismacy.com slash books. We've actually got a little little preview from the introduction there and stuff. So if people want to check it out, it's it's up there. But uh, Jennifer, we, we sure appreciate it. Keep, thanks for talking with us and keep up the good work to you. I mean, seriously, like, you know, this, this Alzheimer's thing, it's a, it's a team sport and we need people like you who are bringing people together and just you know, providing a, a, a place to, to share stories, to share the ups and downs. It's, it's really important. So thank you for doing what you're doing. You're welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah. I'll let you get your call going and Mace and I'll wrap up. Okay. Obviously, because he just, he just exited the stage. <laughs> well, I go ahead. I'm going to say a good thing Trab's here because he's the smartest guy I know and he's a very good speaker. And he, I'm just, I'm like the, you know, guy who just kind of stands around and <laughs> says, ah, shucks every now and then. You know? I can relate. Well, I really enjoyed the book. You had some advice at the end for people living with Alzheimer's like yourself. And I don't have the book handy because I left it in my husband's briefcase when we were emptying the trailer. Do you remember what some of that advice was? No, to tell you the truth, I haven't <laughs> read it yet because it'll take me the rest of my life to read it. <laughs> now, it was a fast read. It was really good. So I think some of the advice was to you know continue doing what you love, 
you know, like you're doing, although I still don't know how you love running a hundred miles. That doesn't sound fun. <laughs> that's just because that's what I do, you know, and everybody's got stuff they do that's kind of out of the ordinary and everybody else says, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, this is the same thing for me. That makes sense. Well, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I don't want this to be a three hour episode. I've had, I've had a couple of really long ones and it, it gets, it gets hard for people to listen to them for that long. So sure. is sure. there anything you want to say before I let you go? No, I just want to tell you, it's been great talking to you. And, you know, you got a very vibrant personality and, and uh, it's been great. Well, thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.